Um, they were rampaged along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. Fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out firing tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or from the bottom with six points and second from bottom with throw. Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double the four, and one six points. Depends what the teams above you do, doesn't it? Unbiased. Miles Davis. Welcome to another episode of Unbiased with Miles Davis, where we look at the stories and the people behind the magnificent game of lawn bowls um, in New Zealand and occasionally uh, around the world as well. Today, I've got a very special guest, a, um, oh, amongst many other things, as you're about to find out. He was also a, he's also a gold medal winner at the Paralympics, Peter Horn. Good morning. Lovely uh, to, to talk to you. Can I just first um, take you right back to the to the beginning, um, so that we can give people a bit of a, an idea of of where you've come from? You were born um, with amniotic band syndrome. Now, can you explain to us, in, in sort of in layman's terms, what that is? Um, basically, your limbs get caught up in your mother's womb, and they don't develop, and. Uh, I was unfortunate. It, it still happens today. I've seen it happen in the recent months. Um, but unfortunately, I was uh, I got four limbs caught up, so that was a bit of a major. It sounds like a, an exceedingly major one, but I, I, I think as we go through this, people are going to be inspired by it that that you haven't let that um, get in the get in the way. Now, when did you? So, first start getting prosthetic limbs because presumably you know that that's something that's developed over the years what was it like when you were born um it was pretty good in those days because of the because of the war and i think we had a lot of uh, limb fitters that were making legs and arms for people who had lost legs during the war so even though they were banged out of tin and out of wood and whatnot um yeah, so for me, it, it basically started when I was a baby, and for the first year of my life, I was uh, sent to the Home of Compassion in Island Bay in Wellington. Um, I was born in a remote town. We lived in Mohawk, and uh, so I was born at Wairua, and um, uh, yeah, it was a very traumatic time for my parents, of course, and my mother, and um, I had uh, three other siblings. Uh, so I was sent down to the Home of Compassion in Island Bay, and um, one of the famous sisters, their sister Leola, actually looked after me. She just recently died at the age of 99. And I went and saw her about six years ago, and she remembered me just like it was yesterday, and it was unbelievable. And she probably made my first um, artificial limb where she strapped a spoon to my right hand uh, to help me feed myself. So that was... That was basically my first limb. So, yeah, that's going back way back then. What a mag magnificent lady, and it's lovely that you managed to get back and, and reconnect with her before before you passed on. You mentioned the war. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, just as a little coincidence, my eldest son was born in Queen Mary's in Roehampton, which I seem to remember had something to do with Douglas Bader. I think they used to make his legs there. Okay, yep, yep. So I got my first set of legs when I was about two and a half years of age. Um, got some pictures of me at the Wellington Artificial Limb Centre. I was very fortunate to have um, some fantastic people there. And a chap called Arthur Thompson was a, a pioneer in his day in making artificial limbs. And nothing was just too much trouble for those people. And um, he... Uh, Followed on, I ended up with a guy, a chap called Joseph Rastafer, and then now I've got a guy, Jeff Goddard, and so I've had three fitters in the 60-odd years I've been going there, so it just shows the dedication of these people and their commitment to the profession. How many times do you have to uh, to get your, your legs refitted, Peter? I presume when you're younger, it's more often because you're growing, but but what about as, a, as you get older? Uh, yeah, no, it's basically just maintenance repairs, um, as you say, when you're growing there, yeah, sure, you you know every six months or a year, you get a new set of legs. But um, now that you're you're a bit older, it's just a bit of maintenance repairs. Things do still break, and 
things happen. Of course, me having four limbs, and because I have four, I actually use them all day and every day, unlike a lot of other people. Um, they might have an artificial arm, but they don't use it. They put it in the wardrobe and forget about it. But uh, mine go on first thing in the morning, and they come off last thing every night. How hard is it? Oh, this is just a, a sort of a curiosity question. How hard is it to to fit all your limbs on? Uh, no. You know, it's no trouble at all. The, the basically, the one on my right wrist is is what we call an opposition plate, and it just straps on. So I just do the the buckle up and then slip my stump inside it. Uh, then the hook usually goes on next, and that just swings around over your shoulders and under your arms and. Uh, um, so it's, it's you're pushing against the cable, which opens the hook, and the rubber bands uh, hold it tight. So you can put as many bands on as you like or to make it as strong as you want. Um, and then, of course, you know you get dressed, and then on go the on go the legs. And they're a lot easier today than they were. You know, originally they were all laced up up to the knee, and it would take half an hour to put them on, get them off. But now they just you just slip in and out of them. It's, it's a piece of cake. Now, I understand that, that your parents decided that um, you weren't going to get any special favours and that, that you were going to go to just a normal school, you know, no, no special schooling. What was your schooling like? Where, where did you go to school? Um, because of the scenario with me moving to, being taken to Island Bay, my father got a posting and uh, I believe he was the first policeman to be posted at Pyro East. And... Uh, we actually lived in Mungavin Ave there, and we had the jail in the backyard. And uh, so I started my first primary school at at, um, at Pyra, and I did that for about two years. And where did you go to? Um, where did you go on to college? Uh, well, we moved from Pyra to Featherston, so I did a little bit of schooling in Featherston. Then we came back to Petoni, and um, Dad was a policeman in Petoni, and I finished primary school there and uh, Hutdale Memorial Technical College. Uh, did that, and uh, yeah, that was. I didn't go on to university or anything. I wasn't uh, a brilliant scholar. I was probably more hands-on, which sounds silly, of course, being a person with no hands. I, 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 I'm just fascinated with this story, Peter. How how were you treated at school generally? Uh, I look back at it now, and I think. I, I was pretty good. We particularly, um, I, I remember Petoni in particular. We, like, we had so many nations at Petoni School, Petoni West, um, all the island people, uh, Indians, Dutch. We had so many, and everybody just got on so well together. And we'd um, go to each other's houses after school and whatnot. Uh, there was no talk of any racial tension, and I don't, I can't ever remember anyone really picking on me with my artificial limbs and that. I, I tried to participate in everything I could, and um, if it didn't work out, you know, um, well, it didn't worry me. I just sat on the on the seat, you know, and watched. Now, you, you, I saw somewhere, Peter, that you played quite a lot of sports. You give it a go. Um, one of them was was darts, and, and that fascinated me. How how do you play darts with it with artificial well, limbs? Yeah, well, it's um, I just hold it in my in my right hand in my little opposition plate, and uh, just like anyone else, you you just spin it out of your hand and aim for the dartboard. And uh, I wasn't too bad at it when I you know we used to play a lot um, when I first joined the bowling club. We'd have a lot of uh, winter leagues um, against different clubs, and we'd play darts, pool, and indoor bowls. And uh, so, yeah, it was it was, a, it was a good hobby, darts, a really good sport, and um, keeps your mind active with the old adding up and subtracting. Yeah, it is. It's a, yeah, it's a magnificent game. So you, you leave school. You're not the most magnificent of of students, but you leave school. What do you do then, work wise? Um. Well, I, I got school C and I I sort of excelled at woodwork and engineering and I thought, well, I wouldn't mind getting into the engineering trade. And um, uh, even though Petoni in those days was a great industrial area, there was all sorts of employment opportunities in Petoni, but 
I did find it hard to get a job, and uh, I had a few setbacks on the way, which was very uh, discouraging, and um, a lot of companies used to have a, an aptitude test where you have to put nuts and bolts and things on things, and you'd have to do it in a certain time, and and I remember going along to one of them, and the the chap said to the guy, well, now he's got to do it with his left hand. And my father said, well, are you stupid? He hasn't got a left hand. He's got a hook. He can't do it. Why did you even invite us along to do this? So we stormed out of that one. Um, but I soon got myself a job with a company called Barclay Engineering, and I worked for them for five years. And um, they were brilliant people to me, and I... My my main job was making water meters, funny enough, and I used to machine them, the brass work and the internals, and uh, I'd assemble them, test them, paint them, run them, and do everything for them. And um, then I'd work their automatic lays, and uh, it wasn't brilliant money uh, for me in those days. I sort of found out that they weren't paying me the, the proper rate, but... Um, I put up with it for five years. I was working so many hours that I was earning damn good money anyhow. So uh, so that was the start of my working career. Where did you go from there, Peter? Well, I, I uh, decided I'd try something different, and I I knew a chap that um, he was the uh, personnel officer for General Motors in Petone, and um, he said, well, come on down here. We are we, they made uh, frigid air in those days. They made stoves, freezers, fridges, and uh, in the Petone plant, they made mufflers and spark plugs, all sorts of silly things. Um, and um, he got me into forklift driving. And uh, so I did a couple of years with them and found that I quite enjoyed uh, forklift driving and uh, being... Um, it meant I didn't have to stand on my legs all day, which is quite hard in, um, in a lot of other jobs where you, you've got to stand still all day. I'm starting to get quite envious of you now. I mean, I've got all four limbs, Peter, and I can't do any of those things that you've spoken about in making the water meters, driving forklifts and doing everything else. I I saw somewhere, Peter, that, that one of your sort of proudest achievements was passing your driving test. Now, when did you do it? Can you run us through that? What was that like? Uh, yeah, well, it sort of, I was a good cyclist in my younger days. So I used to bike everywhere to work and, I'd play table tennis and I'd bike to table tennis and uh, I'd bike from Batoni up to Nine Nine and then back to Batoni to the Empire Club to play at night. And then I thought, well, I wouldn't mind getting my licence. And, and um, so I thought, well, how do I go about this? So I went along and saw my doctor and he gave a certificate and said, well, there's no reason why you can't get it. You're physically fit. You're capable of, of driving and um, so yes I applied for a test and uh, I had a sister who uh, gave me a few lessons and she was really cool and we used to travel around the hills in Korokor and Eastbourne and I learned to do hill starts and all sorts of things and I thought right well I'm ready to go and um, I went along to they said oh what about trying a um, a driving school just to see if you're, you're right. So I thought, well, that will help me at the end. So I went along to this driving school and after the guy first lesson, he said, well, I don't need to do anything with you. You're ready to rumble, mate. So we applied for the licence and um, went in and the guy said, oh, well, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think you're capable of holding the steering wheel of a car. He said, I don't think you're strong enough. And I said, oh, okay. Um, well, how can I prove that to you? And he said, well, um, so I bent over and picked up his desk and said, well, how strong do you have to be? Can you do that? And he said, well, let's go and give you a test, eh? So we went out and did the road test. Just, that's just magnificent. Have you had that sort of, um, not defiant attitude, but determined attitude all your life? I believe so. People say I'm very stubborn, and I, uh, I think that might be the word you're looking for, but it, it makes me, if somebody says to you, you can't do something, I've got to prove them wrong. And 
just because you do something some way, it doesn't mean to say it's the right way of doing it. And I've proved to people over the years that there is other ways of doing things, and sometimes my way is actually better. And other people have uh, adapted their ways of doing things. So yeah, I'm, I am a little bit stubborn in that in that regard, but um, I think it's helped me get through this scenario of life. Yeah. Uh, now, Peter, when did you, you played all these other sports? You, you're working away. You you, you can do engineering. You know, you're a man of many talents. When did you first get involved in in lawn bowls? Um, well, my dad was a good bowler, and he bowled out of the Batoni Club for years. And uh, we shifted up to um, Tiger, which is the top end of Lower Hut, and um, I I played indoor bowls, and I on the carpets and I, I quite enjoyed that and I excelled and I think uh, the second or third year I won the Hutt Valley Open singles which was uh, just about fell over when I won it because there was you know hundreds of people entered it in those days and um, I said well I wouldn't mind having to go to outdoor bowls and quite enjoyed like having a beer and in those days the place to go to have a beer was the bowling club so I went along to the bowling club and got interviewed by uh, the vice president and the president, both of them by the name of Jack. And, uh, well, young man, are you come here to play bowls or, or drink uh, beer? And I said, oh, definitely bowls, definitely bowls. <laughs> and uh, so that's where it started off. And um, at that stage, I didn't even know if I could hold a bowl because it was totally different to indoor bowls. How did you? Now that fascinates me in there. So how how do you hold it? What's the mechanism that that you deliver the bowl with? Well, the gear I wear every day of my life is what I use for everything. I don't have any special attachments for anything. So my opposition plate on my right hand is um, how do I describe it? It's like a, a wristband around your wrist, and it's got a little plate on it, and that I hold things between the plate and that, but. A bowl's far too big to hold in there, although I can open it up and hold a cricket ball in there. I do put my cricket back in there when I'm bat- when I'm batting and whatnot. But um, I uh, we went out in the backyard and Dad said, "Well, you won't be able to hold it between the two hands. You're going because you won't get enough weight to deliver the bowl." So I found out I could actually balance the bowl on my hand and it sort of rested on the plate. It doesn't have to rest on the plate, but it sort of rests on the plate. And I said, well, I can't get the backswing like you do. So I use sort of like a pendulum type where I do a quick pullback and then deliver the bowl real quick out of my hand. And I discovered that I could do it. And um, so we went down and had a few roll-ups on the green and, um, yeah, uh, that's when the history started, I guess, of uh, bowling. How hard do you find it to, to get weight with, with that sort of action? Uh, oh, it's pretty good because I, for some unknown reason, I seemed to get right down low when I first started and I could get the the bowl away real smooth. And a lot of people said to me that you've got an advantage. You haven't got any fingers. That's what other people do. They get their little finger or big finger gets in the way and sends the bowl off with a wobble. and you get it away perfectly each time. So you, you've got more. <laughs> I kept saying I had an advantage. Which, yeah, okay, well, yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. But That's a bit of a compliment to you, though, as well, though, isn't it? Because, you know, you, you, well, can, say, you can say whatever you like, Peter, about it, but you certainly don't have an advantage. I think the advantage is in, in your attitude and the, and the way that you approach things and, and your dedication to, to perfecting things. Now, you, you, so you're playing bowls. When did you uh, won an indoor title? When did you win your first club title? Uh, I think I won my first club title was a junior peers in about 1979, and um, we actually had a TV crew there filming on the day. Funny enough, I've never seen what they produced, but they were there filming, and um, yeah, so that was the <clears throat> my first title was a junior peers, and. Um, because um, my dad was the, he was one of the top bowlers in the club. He didn't want to play with me at that stage, and uh, you know he, he'd wait to see how I developed. So, um, 
it wasn't for a, a couple of years that I started playing with Dad, and um, then we won. I think we won uh, what they call the handicap pairs in the club. We uh, the first year bowlers given a number of points, and and of course he was the top bowler, so he got no points, and we won that. And then the following year we won the um, the club the trade of pairs, and uh, went on to win the champion of champions in Wellington from about fifty other teams. So that was really cool. That must have been magnificent playing with Dad. I, I, how did you? I, I lo, your Dad sounds a, a lot like you in the way that no, no, you've got to earn things like that. I mean, I, I, as me as a Dad, I'm soft as anything. I'd be going, oh, I'll, I'll play with you. But your Dad was no. You've got to prove yourself to be good enough to come in in with me. How hard yeah. did you have to work to convince him? Um, I, I think he realised early on that this kid had a bit of potential here, and. Um, you know, we'd we'd go and have a roll up together, and and of course around about that time, we, we I lost my mother and and Dad lost his wife, and so we sort of became, you know, inseparable. And we lived together, and um, he'd sort of retired, and then he was doing the greens at Tighter as well, and uh, the greenkeeper. So we'd go down there quite a bit, and. Um, I'd help him roll the greens and prepare things and do things. So we spent a lot of time together at the club and and having a social drink as well. So we we got on really cool, me and Dad. That sounds yeah, that sounds that sounds good. And I suppose in times of of tragedy like that, when when you lose your mum uh, and your wife, you, uh, you do tend to to bond. I, I've had the same thing with my two youngest who've who've lost their mum. I, I Peter, I, I'm fascinated now. You're playing bowls. You're obviously getting a bit of attention. You know, you've won club titles. You've won a centre title now as well with your dad. When did you yep. first attract the attention of the um, New Zealand selectors leading up to you going to your first Olympics in, in Seoul in 1988? Um, probably in those days, sort of, you know, apart from being in the Wellington Junior Rec team, but... I probably wasn't that keen on on playing um, wet bowls as such. I sort of didn't see any point in it. To me, it, I enjoyed going away to tournaments and having fun and with my mates. And uh, I mean, sure, we played in the club champs and in the, the events that led on to centre events. And uh, I think some of the centre events in, in the old days were were pretty miserable. I I can remember our first junior fours that we played in and, and I think we took four or five days off work to play in this thing and um, we're very grateful we never won it but the winners, you know, got a a tray and a key ring and something, you know, and you think my God, you know, you're taking five days off work, people stayed in motels and, and this is the prize you get it's, um, <laughs> it was sort of defied the logic of it all, you know but, but you get the call up for for the Olympics. Can you remember you know, who gave you the call and and um, what your reaction was? Well, it was a bit different in, in those days because um, bowls New Zealand sort of weren't involved with disabled bowls and and didn't know anything about it probably. And there was a few of us around in New Zealand that were playing, and um, I belonged to an outfit called um, Amputee Sports. New Zealand, and uh, they decided that um, they had bowls at the Paralympic Games, and would we be interested in going? And uh, I said, oh, yeah, I, I'd be keen. So um, um, Parafed, as they were known in those days, never actually invited me. I was I came in through the back door through this other organisation. We had to raise our own money, our own funding. So the two of us that went, we had to raise our own money. Um, the shift to Michonne made us feel really, really welcome into the team, but we weren't part of the team, if you know what I mean. We, You were the bowlers, and you got up in the morning, and you carried your bowls down to the bus depot, and if they saw you at 8 o'clock at night, they'd be lucky to see you again. So uh, it was a little bit different in those days, but, yeah, Certainly after that, um, became on the scene, of course, and um, once you won a gold medal, well, they want to know you, don't they? 
Yeah, I can well imagine. You won a gold and a bronze uh, as well. You know, what was it, what was it? Uh, did you ever, in your wildest dreams, and I, you strike me as an aspirational individual, but did you ever think that you'd be fronting up representing New Zealand at an Olympics? No, I didn't. No, I mean, I, I didn't know anything about it. And, and I, I had a good old mate of mine, who you probably know, Barry Winks, who passed away last year. And Barry, Barry had played table tennis, and I'd, I'd played table tennis with Barry for years, and and he didn't know anything about lawn bowls. He was he wasn't into it in those days. But um, I knew that he represented New Zealand uh, at, at, at table tennis and done quite well. So I sort of knew a little bit about the sports. And then, of course, then Eve Rimmer was uh, a real promoter of um, the paraplegic sports and. Um, so I sort of got into it through that, basically. And, um, you yeah, know, so when I went to the games, I was sort of apprehensive and I'm sort of thinking, well, who do I play? What am I going to play? I mean, there's going to be nobody with my disability, so what the hell am I? So I I, I drew what, in those days, they put you into sections of, like, you had an arm disability or a leg disability. So... I could play them both, but I wasn't allowed to play them both. I had to choose. So, because the other gentleman had a leg missing, we thought, well, we'll put him in the leg section and put Peter in the arm section. So, I played, went out and played my first game, and I played against an Australian, and he had two good legs and a good arm, and his left arm was missing, which he didn't bowl with. And I thought, well, he's not really disabled, is he? But what the hell? I mean, I play against able bodied all my life at that stage. So, uh, I went out, we had a good tussle, and, and I managed to beat him. And I thought, oh, this is cool, you know. And um, I mean, the Korea, Korean people, they just loved me to bits. So they, they were all over me, and they just uh, they, they couldn't get enough of me over there. <laughs> have you have you still got girlfriends over there, Peter, or can't you say? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of them come back here. One of them, uh, is, she's involved with the... Um, uh, the sports psychology of things over there. And, of course, they never played bowls in Korea up until we had the Paralympics. And now Korea is a world force in bowls. So it just shows you that we, you know, uh, taking the, the bowls to them, um, hence the light built them a green over there, and it's just flourished. It's gone from, you know, really got huge. Now, talking of, of, of influence, um, obviously you, you as a you got into bowls, you've represented New Zealand, you've, you've played at the highest level, you've won titles in, in New Zealand as well. You've set up then, or helped set up, uh, the New Zealand Disabled Lawn Bowls. Tell me about that, Peter. Yeah, and it's about 2003 or four. we had a, a meeting in Lower Hutt. We had a tournament, and... Um, a chap John Burton, you probably know from the Dilmar T people in Auckland. Um, we had a chat and we talked and we said, well, why don't we start New Zealand Disabled Lawn Bowl? So we started it off. We had a, um, a, t- a tournament at the Hut Club and we invited people from all around New Zealand and it, it got going from there, and, and now we've got, you know, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 members, and um, it, it's not about, we don't have a lot of tournaments, although it is getting better, but it's just about showing people how to play the game, that they can play, you can play lawn bowls and be alongside able, able-bodied people all the time. You fit in there well, and, um, you know, we we ask no favours, we all we all play the game to the rules of New Zealand bowls. We don't we don't have any special favours or anything like that. Even the people in the wheelchairs, they still play the, the game to the letter of the law. Uh, do you find more and more people coming into uh, to um, disabled bowls in, in New Zealand? Is, is it a, an expanding sport in terms of more and more disabled people taking it up? It is. It is very much. And we're, we're finding it... Um, it's sort of a cloudy area because we're getting a lot of people with brain injuries and uh, not so much like in the old days it was if you had a limb missing, you were definitely in the team and that was it, you know. But now it's it's a more technical side of it. So people have to go through 
a series of tests to and, and score points to see if they're eligible first off and and then to, to put them into a class, uh, a category. And there's always a debate about, you know, whether someone is or isn't eligible. But um, my way is, well, the more the merrier. I mean, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard scoring point thing, but they do go before a panel, usually two or three people. And um, the end result, I mean, some people have been turned down and, and others have got through. So it's, it's a funny scenario. Uh, the thing that amazed me, and, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll profess my ignorance of, of um, disabled bowls in New Zealand, I was absolutely blown away when the Parajax played in bowls three five, and they all had different, you know, the Bruce Wakefields or the you know, Mark Noble. They all yeah. had v- all different disabilities, yet yeah. all magnificent bowlers playing and competing and and competing well with world class bowlers in there. That must have been inspirational for you, as as it was for me. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, we got a huge feedback from that. Um, People saw that and they they were astounded to think that you know um, yeah like Mark and Bruce and then you've got Pam and and Carolyn and Linda and uh, I mean they they all excelled exceedingly well and I think um, you know the, a couple of games could have gone slightly uh, our way but they didn't um, that's the way it goes. Um, as you know, they had another tournament recently where uh, the Parajacks were reintroduced to it to qualify for the TV show. And um, the Parajacks were actually the top qualifiers, but ended up getting beaten in the quarterfinals by the eventual winners from Hawke's Bay. So um, very, very close. I mean, they could have been back in the TV show this year. and. Uh, that would have been superb, but we've we've had to live with that one. So yeah, hey, at least they've got the opportunity now, Pete. And I've got to say, uh, from a personal point of view, I miss them. Uh, they're all characters. They're not just you know great bowlers with disabilities. They're all characters who I I really enjoyed. So you you guys have done a fantastic job giving this opportunity for for people to um to represent the disabled at at, at the top level of the sport. Um on a personal level, uh, Peter, um yep. you were off air before we were just quickly having a chat and you mentioned you had mince on toast that was prepared for you. Who prepared that for you? Oh, well, in my uh She's uh, my partner, my caregiver, my flatmate. So there we go. So, In any particular order? <laughs> um, it de- depends whether I've been good or bad, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, she came knocking on my door about 25 years ago and she's still here. So, um, And uh, I love her to bits and I love her kids and her grandkids and We've got a great granddaughter now who I just love to bits. She's 19 months old, and that that keeps me going. That's just fantastic. Now, as well, I believe this year was a, a big year for you um, on the Queen's Birthday Honours List, member of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Um, I want to know when you got how you first found out that you'd been put forward for this award, and then secondly, how well how did you manage to keep it a secret? Yeah, it's it's very difficult, isn't it? Um, it's they send you a, uh, an invitation that um, you've been nominated, and uh, would you like to accept or decline? Um, you have to fill out certain amounts of paperwork, and uh, and I had a talk to my Karen and said, well, what do you think? And she said, well, I think you've done the hard yards. You probably deserve it. And um, we weren't too sure who had put my name forward and we're sort of scratching our heads about it. And uh, anyhow, we eventually found out that it was uh, one of the original presidents of the bowling club that interviewed me way back in 1978. He'd done it and he's still, still going at the age of 94. And um, he put my name forward. So, yeah, I decided to accept it. And then I thought, oh, God, I'll, I'll probably get a lot of feedback. People will be negative and they'll say, oh, why does he deserve that? And, and anyhow, 
I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll go for it. And then, yes, of course, then you've got to keep it quiet for about three months. And <laughs> that's the hardest thing of a lot, of course. And then you you want people to sort of, we had a bit of a party, and it was sort of like, well, I can't invite people before it comes out in the paper. You just can't do it. So, <laughs> so we managed to get over that hurdle. That is, uh, well, congratulations, anyway, uh, Peter. I, I, yeah, I think it's it's well earned. Now, uh, finally, I want to know what are you doing with yourself nowadays? How do you keep yourself busy? Um, well, I've just fully retired. Basically, I I was with the uh, the, the railways for ten years as a signal man, and then I retired from there, and then I got myself a little part time job for the last six years. Um, delivering the newspapers at night time for stuff. And that's when I used to listen to you on the Talkback Miles. And uh, I enjoyed you because you had a variety of subjects where other people seemed to be basically the same old boring, um, shall we say. And I remember one particular night you had a a 90-year-old woman rang up that had had her phone was going to be cut off. And, and I was amazed at the effort you went to make sure she was looked after. I think she had a son in town or something. I never heard the, the end result of the conversation, but I think Spark were taking landlines off, off people and this poor lady had no way of communicating with her son in town. And it was, uh, I thought it was a very great thing that you did for her that night. So, yeah, you, you should be honoured as well, mate. Oh, I appreciate that, Pete. I do, I must admit, I do love um, the talkback. I love the audience. I love the fact that you can communicate with people in, all over the country and hear, the, hear their stories, just like we're hearing your one now. Um, what advice would you, well, the final two questions, what advice would you give to people who have disabilities or become disabled later in life, which I'd imagine would be harder to adapt to than, than someone who, who's be, you know been used to it and grown up with it all their life. What advice would you give them? Yeah, no, I mean, it, the thing is that, you know, you, you, you either want to be wrapped up in cotton wool or you get out there and give things a go. And that's basically what I did in my life. And, and sometimes it never worked out, but I'm sure if, if you know, if, if, People lose an arm or a leg or something. No, I've seen it heaps of times, and and they're bowlers now as well. Uh, some of these people and sports people, and uh, you'll see them probably next week in the Paralympics. Um, uh, you know, it's some of the feats these people perform are absolutely amazing, and um, they'll inspire anyone to do anything. And, and I mean, don't be embarrassed. Get out there and do it, and if People want to come along and have a go at bowls. Just contact us or Bowls New Zealand. We're happy to take them along for a roll up. Show them how to do it. There's always a different way of delivering a bowl. Um, a few years ago, I had a mate that who I played bowls with, and he ended up having a head-on car crash, and uh, he was very, very lucky to survive. And spent months and months um, learning how to walk again. And he said, oh, I'll never be able to play bowls again. I can't, I can't balance him. So I said, okay, well, how about we try this? Unbelievable, he said. I, I can try it. I can do it. And it was just something simple. And so instead of stepping out, I showed him how to put his hand on his knee so he could balance himself. And he played for a few more years. So, you know, there's, there's always another way of doing it. That's well, Sometimes I have a nickname, MacGyver, because I come up with all these cunning plans and things. So. <laughs> and do you consider yourself disabled or differently abled? Yeah, I'm definitely not disabled. Um, yeah, maybe a couple of drug drugs uh, might help me on that field. But um, uh, no, I... I've never regarded myself as a disabled person. And, and um, you know, you, if I walk down the street, I know if there's a uh, too good looking woman on the other side of the road, I'll get more steers than they will. But that doesn't worry me. You know, it's. Uh, That's because you're such yeah. a handsome, strikingly handsome man, Peter. Um, oh, you obviously haven't, you, haven't, you obviously haven't seen my picture. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> well, my eyesight is faded, mate. So, so <laughs> the, can I just thank you so much for your time, Pete, and for everything that you do for for the disabled and for disabled bowls in, in New Zealand. I think your your um, 
Queen's birthday honour was well and truly deserved. Uh, I find you inspirational, so I, I'm sure many others will, and I'm sure they're going to enjoy listening to this chat. So I wish you, you and your partner, Stroke Carer, Stroke Flatmate, all the best for the future. Thank you very much, Miles. It's been lovely to talk to you, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to keep doing what I'm doing, and uh, if I can help anyone, and whether it be bowls or or just in life in general, I'm happy to uh, step up. Um, I quite often get called into the artificial limb centre just to show people how things work and what you can do with them, and um, some people are just blown away to think that you know that you. They didn't know that a hook could be used for so many things, and it's uh, it's a practicable thing, not not a dress article. So, thank you very much indeed. Um, they were rampaged along, won their first two games. They've lost their last two, but they could have probably won both of them. Fantastic looking facility there in the deep south. I'm sure they're going to come out fine tonight. From memory, he was leading last week. Are you going to be leading this week? Or in the bottom with six points and second for bottom with throw? Yes and no. Yes and no. It paid off for them. They got a two, double a four, and one six points. Depends what the teams above you do, doesn't it? I'm Bikes. I'll stay.